Thank you, Robert. It's fantastic to be here. Thank you so much for the kind invitation to speak. And I, I'm going to start with a question for you all. What do you think unites this eclectic group of people? Three murderers, a pornography collector, Karl Marx's daughter, a president of Yale, a radical suffragette, a vicar who was found dead in the cupboard of his chapel, the inventor of the tennis net adjuster, an aunt and niece who were poets and also happened to be lesbian lovers, and a cocaine addict who was found dead in the lavatory of a railway station. Any guesses? Um, neurodiverse. <laughs> Definitely neurodiverse, I think, is a common thread. They actually all helped create the Oxford English Dictionary. The OED was the Wikipedia of the 19th century, a huge crowdsourcing project in which, over a 70-year period from 1858 to 1928, members of the public were invited to read the books that they had to hand and to send to the editor of the dictionary in Oxford examples of how particular words were used in those books. I wanted to know how many people did that and who they were. So for the past eight years, I've been scouring archives around the world in order to know where they lived, what they did with their lives, who they loved, the books they read, and the words that they contributed to the dictionary. Some people have remained mysteries to me, despite tra trawling through censuses and marriage certificates and death records, um, but most have come to life with an incredible force as though they've been calling out for attention for years and to finally be recognized as the unsung heroes of the creation of the world's largest dictionary. They were people from all around the world, from South Africa, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, America, Europe, the Congo, Japan. I wanted to tell their remarkable stories and to shine a light, uh, a light on them um, because they helped create, as I said, this extraordinary and uplifting example, one of the most extraordinary and uplifting examples of collaborative endeavor, I think, that the world, the Western world has seen. So the OED all began a little bit like Marlowe Studios with three men with a radical vision. It was London, 1858. Richard Trench, Herbert Coleridge, and Frederick Furnival. They were linguists who were fascinated with words and language. They were part of this quirky society in London called the Philological Society that still exists. I'm a member of, of it, a lot of men in tweed jackets and bow ties still. And they wanted to revolutionize dictionaries. Rather than being prescriptive and telling you how a word should be pronounced or how a word should be used, which is what Samuel Johnson had done a hundred years previously, these three men wanted to create a dictionary that was descriptive, that described how people used words. They wanted to document every single word in the English language, but they were really smart. They realized that a small group of men in London or in Oxford couldn't do that massive task alone. So they reached out to the public and they made an, an appeal to English speakers all around the world to read their local books, write out, slip, write out words and citations from those books on little slips of paper, and they asked them to send them to Oxford to the house of James Murray, who was the edit, ed, ed, editor. Um, now, they had no idea whether this would work or not, whether anyone would even send them one, one word. And this is a thing about true collaboration, right? It's an adventure. You never know whether it's going to work, what the outcome or what the best solution is going to be. But for the OED, the response was massive. And the result became, as we know, the most famous dictionary in the, in the world. So many people sent in words that Royal Mail had to put a special post box outside James Murray's house at 78 Banbury Road, Oxford, which you can still go and see. The post box is still there, and now there's a blue plaque saying that that's where 
James Murray lived and he set up a scriptorium in the back garden where he created the dictionary. Now this was, and so people sent in slips from the disparate cor corners of the globe. And this was not just a project of the wealthy upper classes. In actual fact, the majority of these people were on the margins. They were autodidacts. They were um, amateurs who actually saw the attraction of being part of a prestigious product, a prestigious project, which, which was attached to one of the best universities. So I start with this story about the OED because it's fresh in, in my mind, because I've just written a book on this called The Dictionary People. Um, but I also, um, I think the main reason why I fell in love with these people is that this was a classic example of how certain tasks can only succeed at scale. They can only succeed by bringing diverse people from different cultures, different social backgrounds, different ages, different skill sets, bringing them together for one task. Also, the OED <laughs> took advantage of the latest technology at that point. So we're thinking of the mid 19th century here. The latest technology was the penny post and steam engines. So this enabled ships to carry these slips and these words and these books across the globe to Murray's house in North Oxford. And now we're faced with new technologies from machine learning to visual image recognition and analysis. But you know, the same combination of the latest technology and a diverse team is a killer combo. And as Robert was just talking about, it's people and technologies. <coughs> it's technology, it's people, it's skills and space. And I'm, rem I'm rem reminded of this at the moment because I was just this morning at a meeting in London at the Victorian Albert Muse 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 Museum where there's a collaboration going on between Oxford and the V&A where we're using machine learning to detect racist language and problematic terminology in the V&A cat catalogue. This is a collaboration between a linguist, a specialist in linked data, um, a data specialist, three museum curators, and a budding grad student from um, Canada who specializes in the history of art. And I've just also finished a book on the Generation Z, um, which was an anthropological study of 18 to 25 year olds. And this was another collaborative project between an anthropologist, a sociologist, a historian, and myself. Now, Gen Zers, of course, are the leaders in collaboration. Their social media platforms and other tech enable collaboration on a whole new level. If, if you're a marginalized queer kid living in rural Scotland who is proud of their Jewish identity and loves the bagpipes, and there was one such student in our data set, um, no, no longer are you the sort of local freak in, in the village, right? You can find your tribe, you, you can find your fam, you can find other people on the internet just like you, and you can make magic together. You can collab. So they 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 form virtual collab houses, hype hype houses, um, and we see this in activism and political movements around trans identity, Black Lives Matter, and the environment. So. Gen Zers, of course, don't see collaboration as compromising their individuality, but rather they see collaborations as opportunities to take advantage of diverse skills and ideas. Disparate people coming together for a common cause, the result of which is greater than the sum of its, of, of, of its parts. And the Gen Zers who we studied told us that they, they just won't take jobs unless they are able to collaborate in their work. They want to work in groups, they want to join workplaces with flexible structures and modular working groups, typical of the Silicon Valley style. Teams in which each collaborator has a unique role to play. So it's not just divvying up um, a large task in, in, into siloed specialisms, but rather working together as one to create something greater than its disparate parts. And the four authors on this book, um, which is called Gen Z Explained, 
we we were so inspired by our subjects that we tried to collaborate and to write the book in a collaborative way, just like the Gen Zers would. And at first, actually, this was really confronting because I realized that each of us came from different disciplines with different standards of scholarship, different ways of doing things. As a linguist, I found it very hard to collaborate. I mean, I loved my collaborator, this sociologist, but she was inclined I, I would never, there were certain things. So for example, when in linguistics, you will only say something if it can be ver verified and uh, proven. It's not the case in sociology. So, uh, so now I've, I've um, learned. So of course, there were a few tensions there. And that, of course, um, reminds me of last, last week, I went to this um, great David Hockney exhibit at, at the Light Room. And I'm sure that most, most of you have seen it these 30 metre high walls and uh, there was a moment and it tracks the and shows you the life and work over 50 minutes of um, of David Hockney and there was a moment in there where you might recall that he said and he and the words came up on the wall he said collaboration means compromise mm -hmm. now each of us here who has collaborated will know the truth of that tension. But I've also, I also have sort of been training myself that when I identify that tension, I question myself and I, and I, I um, because I think that it, that it happens when I go into a collaboration with a preconceived idea of what the outcome might or should be or what I want from it. Instead, I try now to go into my collaborations with a mindset that this is an adventure. This is, and I don't know how it's going to work out, but you know, I just love to work with these people. I love their ideas. I love their energy. Um, and so that for me now is sort of the key of the collaborative projects that I choose to be a part of. And I think that that spirit, just to finish up, that spirit of adventure, I think is the same sort of collaborative spirit that those first ed editors of the Oxford English Dictionary had. And to be honest, I think that it's the same spirit that I'm detecting, certainly in, in the words of Robert, but that I think all of us are going to detect in, in, in the talks coming up. So thank you.